Welcome to Lake and Bethel. For those of you who are here and those of you who are watching this online through Facebook, I'm amazed at how many people are watching on Facebook. Over 3,000 hits a week is what we've been getting, which is quite shocking to me. Almost makes me want to pay attention to how I dress, but not really. Anyway, my name is Sherwin Branson. I'm pastor here at Lake and Bethel. This is the church that values authenticity over hype. Today we're asking the question, does God want to bless? And as I was thinking about that, I remembered some things from my childhood in the 60s uh, in, on a farm in Northwest Iowa. Not a lot to do. Three channels on the black and white TV, only one TV in the house, and my mother had absolute control of that. Saturday nights was always a nightmare because we had to watch Lawrence Welk, which was Terrible punishment for anyone. And, you know, it's Lawrence Welk's music made me want to go in my room and put my phonograph on and listen to Led Zeppelin at wide open because I just couldn't deal with Lawrence Welk. What do you do if you're a kid on a farm in Iowa in the 60s with nothing to do, no video games even? Well, my cousin and I came up with the idea that we would start a rat farm because rats were in abundance. Rats thrive wherever there's pigs being fed or wherever there's a large pile of corn. And so we had lots of rats and they were easy to catch. Uh, we raised dogs also and Rottweilers in particular like to find rats and catch them for you. So we had all these rats around, hundreds and hundreds of rats we would see. And so we decided that we were gonna start a rat farm and we wanted to trap the rats live, but my Parents were not very enthusiastic about this. We had a building for it. My cousin and I, we fixed the building up so that the rats couldn't get out. And uh, we were going to catch them live, but my parents wouldn't spring for a trap to catch them. So we decided we we're going to make a live rat trap. Well, that didn't work either. The rats did not survive the trap, no matter how well we intended it to be. My cousin and I decided that because of this, we knew that the universe was against us. We were just cursed with bad luck. So I had kind of this idea that, you know, whatever forces there were, were not amenable to us. Then I got to Western Seminary in Holland, Michigan, you know, preacher school. I had these old guys teaching me there who were really smart. One of them actually had a doctorate in astrophysics, decided he didn't like that field, so he went back and got a doctorate in theology so he could teach at a seminary. And I remember him saying, well, God is your friend. And I, that, that struck me as, as such a strange concept, that God is friendly, that he wants to be your friend. And I still have to ask that question periodically, does God really want to bless me? Does God want to bless me or is he just testing me all the time? Or is it both? Then what about you? Is God testing us with this virus? Is he testing you or even is this virus something from God? Or is he using a virus to test us all? Why doesn't he just end it? And while he's at it, he could and mosquitoes and fleas and chiggers too? Or why doesn't he end Alzheimer's or cancer? Does he want to bless us? And if he does, do the things that he sees as blessings not look like blessings to us? But is it his intention to bless us in this life? Well, I went through the New Testament, picked out some passages that seem to address that, and that's what we're going to cover today. They are printed on the back of your bulletins, or you can find them on our website online. The first one is from Matthew 7. It says this, and this is from the New Living Translation. Keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. 
For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Now, this passage is often taught using the ASK acronym, where it's, you know, A-S-K and ask, seek, knock. The important thing to do to know about this passage is the way the New Living Translation words it here much more accurately than most. It says, keep on asking. The Greek has a special tense to it. It's Greek is much more nuanced than English. And it, when Jesus said this, he was saying it in what they call the present imperative, which accurately translated into English is keep on asking. Many of the Bible translations just say, ask and you'll receive. This says keep on asking. I think it's much more, lo- more logical. Now, if you do that and it says, you know, you'll receive what you ask for, well, what in the world are we doing? Why aren't we out buying lottery tickets right now? Because if we're going to receive what we ask for, that would make sense. I'm too much of a Hollander to buy a lottery ticket, but that would make sense, wouldn't it? But then we forget the thing of how people taught in the first century. The Jewish rabbis of the first century used hyperbole as a common teaching technique. And a hyperbole is an exaggerated statement or claim not meant to be taken literally. Now, we all have friends who insist that the Bible must be taken literally, exactly as it says. But I'm wondering why they will shake hands with you if they believe that. Because Jesus also said, if your right hand causes you to sin, chop it off. Because it's better for you to enter into heaven with one hand than be cast into hell with both hands. But there's lots of biblical literalists who have both hands. So how does that work? See, the point is that Jesus didn't mean this literally. He used hyperbole. And his point here is that you're going to greatly increase the odds of getting what you ask for if you keep on asking. You'll greatly increase your odds of finding what you look for if you keep on seeking. You will greatly increase the odds of the door opening if you keep on knocking. God wants us to work with him in answering our prayers. Now this particular passage goes on and says this, you parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? Now, from this passage alone, we can conclude that God wants to bless us because he loves us more than what we can possibly love our own children. And he's smarter than us. So what doesn't look good to us might look really good to him. Jesus said more like this in John chapter 10. He said, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for his sheep. Here we see the thief, which is the devil, has a purpose. He wants to steal your joy. He wants to end your life. And until he ends it, he wants to make it miserable. And he wants to destroy you. Jesus' purpose is to give you a rich and satisfying life. He really desires to bless you. He even sacrificed himself for us. So then what's with all this suffering? What's with all these problems? What's with this virus? Well, maybe our suffering will look like blessings when we know more. Maybe God knows something we don't. Paul talked about this, Romans chapter 8. He says this, Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? And again, that's a hyperbole. 
God is not some genie that we can pick up out of a lantern, rub it, and he pops out and gives us three wishes. His spectrum is much wider than that. He gives us blessings after blessings. Might not be what we ask for. You know, we could ask for a hot fudge Sunday, and instead he gives us a month worth of balanced meals. His blessings surpass our understanding. So if God really wants to bless us, what do we do? Well, we relax and let him do it. Hang on, because he's got this. I, uh, I enjoy a road trip. And sometimes I take my kids with me, and sometimes I don't. John can tell you all about all of our road trips that we've taken. He's uh, been on Interstate 80 more times than he cares to think about it. His brother is on his way here from Salt Lake City right now. And uh, I enjoy those trips to Salt Lake City. I actually like driving through the vast wilderness of, of the Great Plains. And uh, my passengers frequently fall asleep while I'm driving. And sometimes on Interstate 80, you get what you call a Nebraska roadblock, where there's two semis riding side by side going about 40 miles an hour. And sometimes you have to brake kind of hard. And I've had it before where people will wake up screaming as I'm applying the brakes hard. And my response is always, look, I've got this. It's okay. Go back to sleep. Maybe that's how we got to understand God, too. He's got this. All through life and even through death, he's got this. And he wants to bless. He wants to bless your marriage. He wants to bless your work. He wants to bless it all. So how do we increase the blessings? And that is the formula Jesus gives us, the ask, seek, and knock. We pray, first of all, and ask. Sometimes we don't have what we need because we don't ask for it. That's an important concept. When my kids are in college, I give them an allowance to get uh, food and clothes and gas. And uh, I've been quite regular about that. Now I've, I'm down to one kid that's on my payroll. That's Jamie, she's 20 years old and she's a student at Grand Valley. And the first of the month I, I give her an allowance to get her through. But sometimes I forget. Sometimes I don't think of it. But God doesn't forget. And even if I don't forget, I still like Jamie to come to me for it. <laughs> the only time I see her is when she wants money. But you know, it's, it's a good thing. I enjoy that interaction. I like it when she texts me, like she just did a few minutes ago, saying that the, um, her car is due for maintenance. Well, get it taken care of then, but, you know. Um, she, I'll take care of it for her, of course. But I like it when she does that. I enjoy the interaction. And maybe God enjoys it when we interact with him. I suspect he does. I like being able to give stuff to my kids. It gives me pleasure. And I suspect it gives God great pleasure to give stuff to you and me, his kids. So ask. He can always say no. And then we have to work at it. To seek him. That's what the seek means. Again, this is an effort on our part. It's work. If you pray for a good job, you're not just going to get one if all you do is sit around and pray. You have to go out and look for it, too. That's just something that has to happen. God likes to work with us. And then the knock part. Again, this is present imperative, knock continually. Now, my grandma had a front room in her house, and she enjoyed it when people came calling. You know, she grew up before telephones, and so she had this one room that was meticulously neat, and that was her front room, as she called it. You all don't even answer your door if somebody comes to it, do you? because it's usually somebody who's asking for your vote or wants some money. I know my office is right next to our front door, 
And there's many times somebody will come to that door and I duck under my desk and pretend I'm not home. Especially if it's a Kirby vacuum salesman. So we just do that. But God answers. Sometimes with a no, but he always answers every prayer. God wants to bless you. And I wonder how many blessings we've missed simply because we didn't ask. I mean, did you ask him to bless this worship service today? Did you ask him to bless your work this week? Did you ask him to bless your relationships? Did you ask him to bless your, faith, your health? Ask. Ask him. Seek him. Knock on his door. It guarantees that your world will change. Now, if you don't do this, your life's going to seem like a gerbil on a treadmill. You know, you're going nowhere, but you're tired anyway. You'll be frustrated, and you'll miss all kinds of blessings. If you do this, your life's going to be easier. He'll help you make goals, and he'll help you accomplish them. You'll be going with his flow instead of against it. You'll receive more blessings. I have been intermittently journaling since I was a college student. And if I go back over those journals and look through them, I can see where most of the prayers have been answered. Things that were big deals to me that weren't, aren't anymore that have been answered. So I encourage you to do that too is then you'll see that many of your prayers will be answered. If you get nothing else out of this today, remember that slide, ask, seek, and knock. Because when we put this into practice, our lives change. Because we know that no matter how dark things are, God really does want to bless us. Let's receive the Lord's benediction. And now, in whatever you do or say, let it be as a representative of the Lord Jesus, all the while giving thanks through him to God the Father. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Amen. Well, I've been uh, asking you all for topics, and the, the one today was suggested to me. Next week, the title is Losing Your Grip. And uh, the person that gave me that idea had a very good reason for giving it to me. So we'll be talking about losing control of things uh, next week. And as always, thanks for listening.